we're going to move on and look at your relationships. Um, because privacy is not the only price that we pay when we go online. As we increasingly communicate online, we may not realize how much technology we use to the point that we may be digitally distracted when we're physically present with our friends. I'm sure we've all found ourselves in that position. Or we may not be aware of the kind of information that we're sharing in a public space or how we may contribute to the growing culture of disrespect and what I like to call public narcissism. So there's the good, the bad, and the unexpected consequences of our online social practices. So the first question is, how is the way we communicate online changing the way we relate to each other, not only online, but interpersonally? Um, and whether it's to our friends, our friends of friends, our online acquaintances, even our even strangers. Um, and in what ways does it contribute to what you and I have talked about, delinquent behaviors? Okay. Well, um, the internet has really changed the way we relate to one another because it has stepped in between <coughs> us. And privacy, online privacy is, is really a contradiction in terms. There, there's really no online privacy. And your parents just told you that, what, 20 years ago when we were being stalked through the internet by something called Time Sync. And it, it followed you everywhere, everywhere you went, and, uh, and tried to you know, take notes. It was like the equivalent of the guy in the trench coat trying to, to track you down. But that got too difficult. And, and uh, the internet crashed. And during Web 2.0, the question became, how do we get them to spy on themselves? How do we get them to just track themselves, put on their own raincoat and their dark glasses, and track themselves? And then give us all the information willingly. Willingly give us all their private information. And lo and behold, we did it. We did it. We took pictures of everybody's babies, and took pictures of our boyfriends, and pictures of our girlfriends, and pictures of our food, and pictures of every friggin' thing that we could think of, and we gave it to them. So they no longer had to come looking for us. We willingly gave it away. Now there's a thing called Boundary coordination. And this is what we do uh, with our Facebook friends. But we were doing this in high school. When you said, I'm going to tell you this, please don't tell anybody else. That's boundary coordination. Okay, so there's information that may be out there, but you coordinate with your second party user, with the co owner of that information, and you set up some rules. Okay, I'm going to tell you this. I lost my virginity to Cody. <laughs> I don't want you to tell so and so. Or there's good boundary coordination, which is I won this award, and I'm telling you because it'd be just too embarrassing for me to tell everybody, because then I'll just look like I'm a jerk and I'm bragging. So there's a certain amount of coordination. And now we do that on Facebook. We do that on Twitter. We do it on, on all our other uh, social media, our OSNs, our online social media networks. But when those things are breached, when, those, when the boundary coordination is breached in cyberspace, the repercussions happen in real space. They happen with your relationship with your best friend. It happens in your relationship with your parent, your boyfriend. It, uh, because the, the number of people in the, in the human network, right, in the human interconnectedness, is so much bigger. So when someone betrays you, you, you told them, I did that with someone so you sad, you just blurred it out, you can't take it back. And too many people have seen it all at once. And this is what we call boundary turbulence. Boundary turbulence. Boundary turbulence 
exists in real space and it exists in cyberspace. But when it's in cyberspace, the repercussions, the waves of pain and hurt and dissemination of your private information, who you gave your virginity to, or that you lost your job, or that your dad lost his job, or that you've been bullied by somebody. Now, it's going to your 300 or 400 people, and their 300 or 400 people exponentially. So it's now to not just X number of people, but to a power of something, to the power of two or the power of three, and it may just seem so uncontrollable. And this is how young people lose their lives. So, the internet is like, I like to think of it as a samurai sword. And I, I think a sword, even though it's a weapon. The internet was created by the Defense Department. So, it can be dangerous. It was, it was actually created to, make, to keep away danger and, uh, and violence. But it can be dangerous. So it's like a samurai sword, fierce and shining and gleaming, and you just want to stare at it, so beautiful. But if you drop it, you can cut your foot off. You can accidentally kill somebody. That means it has to be handled by somebody with some skill. We, should, we need to change the way we treat the internet. That's why I just think this video from Pivot is so important that we have to start thinking, but more as tool and less as toy. It has such far-reaching repercussions. Such far-reaching repercussions. And the thing is, again, we don't think of the, the privacy issues. I, I just had to read, you, you kind of talked about it, but I have to read Twitter's policy or, or spy policy. Twitter's spy policy. <laughs> When using any of our services, you consent. That's the first one. All you have to do is use Twitter, and you consent to the collection, transfer, manipulation, storage, disclosure, and other uses of your information described as this privacy policy, which we know is a spy policy. Irrespective of what country you reside in or supply information from, you authorize Twitter to use your information in the United States and any other country where Twitter operates. So just by virtue of the fact that you're using it, you have consented. You have consented. Now the thing is, most of my students are, are um, film and television students, and um, the thing is, the, the kind of software and hardware that we are going to be using like now some of you are going to be multimedia. A lot of this is going to exist in the cloud. So it means we have to be really trustworthy in the internet. We have to change the way we interact. We can't be showing our boobs and showing our privates. We can't just be snapping our food and, you know, being crazy with it. We have to be responsible because the kinds of tools we're going to be using when you're editing your movie and you found some guy to do your effects in Singapore and you're going to upload everything to the cloud and he's going to download it to the cloud and work on your film that you have spent all your money shooting and editing and working on. I mean, this is your life's blood. This is all your dreams and the hopes. Right? The stuff is going to appear on Pivot and participate. Right? <laughs> but you have to know that you are a trustworthy person and that we are cultivating a culture, an online culture, that is based on responsibility, on trust and accountability. I mean, if we're going to really do this, if we're going to take back what should have been as protected as the airwaves, but it's not. We're going to really take that back and do what we want to do and change our image, change the image that other people have, have, have you know, put on us with our films, with our video, change the perception of women, of young black women, of young black men, the invisible Asians, right? Okay. We have to be responsible with these tools. Some of these tools, scene chronized. 
Okay, synchronize. It's in the cloud now. All the software is in the cloud. You can take your 2K, your 4K footage in the cloud and work on it and edit it and do all your um, your effects and your coordination, your your um, the um, scene breakdowns. All that's going to be in the cloud. It's not going to be clogging up your computer. But we have to be really trustworthy individuals.